uh, first, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, uh, thank you very much for the amazing introduction. That's really nice of you, Ajuna. So, let me start. So, uh, I'm a lecturer at Birkwick University of London. So, my research broadly focuses on collaboration. Within that, I look at university industry interactions as well. So the request was that I should uh, talk about uh, some working papers. Uh, so then I have selected two working papers on academic entrepreneurship in a resource-constrained environment. So in a minute you will understand what did I mean by resource-constrained environment. But so these two papers, in the first paper, we look at motivation and decision-making approaches of entrepreneurial academics in a resource constrained environment. And in the second paper, we talk about diversification strategies adopted by entrepreneurial academics in a resource constrained environment. So if you have any question, please feel free to ask. So just to start with, you all know what we mean by academic entrepreneurship. Anyone who has just this for me to understand the level to which I should go to. Anyone who knows what you mean by academic entrepreneurship? I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, um, apart from the old traditional understanding of, of the TTO concept of how uh, discoveries and research results flow through techni technology tra transfer offices, that's a very narrow understanding. In our, in my view, it's a much broader uh, understanding of a proactive. Uh, pro problem seeking activity or behavior on the part of the people who are academics or working within an academic environment that spins out not just uh, spin off companies, not just uh, uh, solutions to companies that are going to solve very specific problems for the companies, but can spin out um, uh, new types of new methods in education, new methods in, 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 in corporate or, or uh, or uh, uh, engagement, and not just corporate, but uh, tradition. Amazing! Thank you very much. That's a, that's a brilliant start to the presentation. That is an amazing start to the presentation. So let me first uh, go into the first uh, paper. Uh, so that's the motivation and decision-making approaches of entrepreneurial academics. I think uh, we got that amazing introduction to academic entrepreneurship there. So in a knowledge-based economy, we all know we are being asked to engage in entrepreneurial activities uh, and also to generate impacts, not just to write theoretical papers. So when we look at the literature on academic entrepreneurship, we could see a little bit of bias towards uh, spin-off formation. Because when we look at the literature, most of the literature talks about spin-off formation. However, as you have brilliantly mentioned, it's not just spin-off formation. As academics, we could engage in entrepreneurial <coughs> activities in multiple ways. So in this particular paper, we focus on the later, where uh, academics engagement in entrepreneurial activities but we do not focus on spin-off formation, but we focus on other types of entrepreneurial engagements by academics. But particularly, we look at the cognition of these entrepreneurial academics. So that is the main research gap we address. But uh, in a maybe few minutes, I'll talk about specific research gaps. But before going into that, uh, following on, the amazing introduction that you have provided. So I think I'll just illustrate what did I mean by the diverse different types of entrepreneurial engagement by academics. Here we have categorized these into two, knowledge transfer and knowledge co-creation. Here knowledge transfer means the unidirectional transfer of knowledge from academics to businesses or to other stakeholders. Knowledge co-creation means we combine the knowledge of academics, more advanced and up-to-date knowledge of academics, with commercial-oriented knowledge of industry. So we when we combine, we develop new knowledge. So if I highlight a few examples, 
trained, uh, the one here conducting training and seminar sessions for industry. And also perhaps providing research-based consultancy for industry, but without closely working with them. And also developing intellectual property and perhaps selling it to industry. In all these three examples, we could see academics kind of develop something on the basis of their knowledge, which they have then transferred to industry. On the contrary, the other three examples, academics very closely work with industry in joint research projects, or academics having very close interactions with industry in joint ventures between university and industry, or in uh, incubators where they closely work with startups. In all these three examples, we could see a very close interactions between academics and industry or businesses to generate new knowledge. So in this paper, in terms of entrepreneurial engagement, these are the two types of entrepreneurial engagements by academics that we focus on. And if you want more to have a better understanding of the distinction between knowledge transfer and knowledge co-creation, here uh, we have this paper, uh, one of the papers that I have published at Technological Forecasting and Social Change. Uh, so you, if you check my profile, you will be able to support the paper where we really make this distinction. So, what are the very specific objectives? So, within these entrepreneurial engagements by academics, the when it comes to motivation, the motivation has been discussed in the literature to say what motivates academics to engage in entrepreneurial activities. However, the literature doesn't differentiate between the motivation to engage in knowledge transfer versus motivation to engage in knowledge co-creation. So as one dimension of cognition, we look at motivation. The second dimension of cognition we look at is the decision-making approaches adopted by entrepreneurial academics. So in a minute I'll explain how we have conceptualized decision-making approaches, but when we, the decision-making approaches had been discussed in entrepreneurship literature, but to our knowledge that hasn't been discussed in academic entrepreneurship literature. So this is the second gap that we intend to address. So in addressing these two gaps, we look at how motivation and decision-making approaches change over time. So again, in both entrepreneurship and academic entrepreneurship literature, there is this gap. And finally, in trying to understand that, our focus is on resource-constrained environments. So that is the discontextual uh, originality adds another dimension to our research because most of the literature focuses on relatively resource rich environments. So with that, I will very briefly talk about how we have conceptualized two key dimensions here, motivation and decision making approaches. So with respect to motivation, we borrowed from entrepreneurship literature there are two types of motivation discussed in entrepreneurship literature, push and pull motives. So here the push motives means there are some negative circumstances and entrepreneurs try to become entrepreneurial in order to overcome these negative circumstances. So when we adapt that to academic entrepreneurship literature, here I have listed some of the negative circumstances that academic entrepreneurs might want to overcome by being entrepreneurial or by engaging in knowledge transfer and co-creation activities. Uh, but maybe it's because insufficient income, so they want to improve their income. Or that they do not have enough network of contacts, so they become entrepreneurial in order to develop their network of contacts. Or they do not have enough resources within the university or department. So they, they become entrepreneurial in order to develop their resources or having no research income or maybe have, they do not have in an industrial partners to collaborate with them. The other end of the continuum is the pull factor. So pull factors are some attractive reasons why academics become entrepreneurial. 
So here I have mentioned some of the pull factors. So to achieve career development, we all know nowadays we are being asked to generate in, in, impacts as academics. So if you want to achieve career development, you have to showcase how our research has generated impacts. <coughs> or maybe to acquire new knowledge and skills. We know that when we work with the industry, uh, we could acquire a lot of commercially oriented knowledge and skills which will help us to understand research gaps as well as to provide really good and effective teaching. And also, perhaps to capitalize on an opportunity. We spot an opportunity, we are so attracted by the opportunity, let's engage in entrepreneurial activities. Or it could be, you could see the difference here uh, uh, about the resources. Initially, as a push factor, I said, uh, the push factor is that you want to, you do not have a lot of resources, so you want to overcome these negative circumstances. But on the other hand, the other end of the continent would be, you may have sufficient resources, still you want to improve your resources. You want to access industrial scale resources. These are more lucrative reasons as to why we want to become entrepreneurial. Or to provide a service to students. <coughs> or maybe for personal satisfaction. We all know as academics, we would love to have recognition, we would love to have status. So for personal satisfaction, we might want to become entrepreneurial. So I suppose now you understand this distinction between push and pull factors. So when we investigated uh, the motivation to engage in knowledge transfer and knowledge co-creation activities in a resource constrained environment, we wanted to see what really motivates them to do that. Based on the entrepreneurship literature, someone might be able to argue that uh, because the entrepreneurship literature says those who are in resource constrained environment seem to be motivated by push factors, whereas those who are in resource rich environment will be motivated by pull factors. Is this true with respect to academic entrepreneurs as well? Or could it change over time? Is it a static factor? And then how would that interact with their decision making approaches? So let me now very briefly explain the conceptualization of decision making approaches. Borrowing from entrepreneurship literature, we look at two types of decision making approaches, causation and effectuation. Here the causation means you start with the goal and then you try to see, well, how I could achieve this goal. Perhaps we can use mean one, two or three. And then you decide, okay, let me try to go ahead with mean one because it generates the highest rewards for investment. Effectuation means we start with resources in hand and then we try to see, well, what can we do with those resources? Perhaps we could achieve goal one, two or three. But I will use the resources to achieve goal one because it minimizes the risk. Let me give a very brief example of uh, this uh, in the kitchen. Let, okay, we go to the kitchen and then we want to prepare a particular meal. So we look at, okay, well, I want to prepare this meal. Let me check different recipes. Recipe one, two, or three. So I will choose the recipe one because it gives me the highest satisfaction for the cost that I incur. So then I might go to the shop and buy all the ingredients and then I will prepare the meal. So would it be fluctuation or causation? It's causation. So I got an effectuation, I go to the kitchen, open the jars, and then, and then I try to see refrigerator. Oh, I have got vegetables, meat, and open the drawer. Well, I have got some pasta. So I, what can I do with it? Maybe I could prepare soup or a pasta. Well, I'm a bit tired now. Which one I could prepare uh, with lowest level of risk? Perhaps the soup, because it's just a matter of putting things together. So that's effectuation. So I decide, the, decide to prepare the soup. So of course we were not looking at the kitchen, but I just highlight the scenario to understand it better. So the, the, the causation and effectuation is coming from Sara Saraswati. So I just wanted to highlight the source. 
So, with respect to the academic entrepreneurship, their engagement in knowledge transfer and cooperation activities, by combining these two aspects, this is the model that we develop. Why we have combined these two aspects? Because we are talking about the cognition of individual academic. Because individual academic is the unit of analysis here. So, based on the literature, as I said initially, I said that the literature argues that uh, those who are in resource constrained environment are mostly motivated by push factors. And also, the literature related to process dimension, they argue that if you are in a resource constrained environment, you are more likely to use the fluctuation approach because you look at the type of resources it had and then you try to see what you could do with it, what sort of entrepreneurial engagements you can do with it. So, uh, from the literature, it is likely that the most of the academics in the resource constrained environment are push effectuation type. But then we also make the argument, perhaps, yes, the whole environment might be in a resource constrained situation, but as an individual academic, when you engage in entrepreneurial activities, perhaps your resource status would be improved. Then perhaps, rather than all the time being motivated by push factor, maybe over time you will be motivated by pull factors. Also, you might also move into a bit of causation as well. So, there is a possibility for these academics with the development of resource status to move from push effectuation to pull causation. So, as I said, this is a working paper, so we are still in the process of developing the positioning and the literature and all sort of things, so please feel free to give feedback on all, any of these aspects. So, um, and also we wanted to see the distinction between knowledge transfer and knowledge co-creation here. In order to do that, what is the methodology that we have adopted? So we use Sri Lanka as a resource constraint environment. Why? Because uh, according to the World Bank ranking, it's a lower middle income country and also it's ranked as 50th, 16th, 26th and 55th percentile ranks with respect to financial, infrastructural, technological and institutional resources. So the, the higher the rank, the stronger the resource status, but you could see when it comes to ranking, almost all the rankings are below 50th percentile. And there are 13 universities in Sri Lanka. But unfortunately we do not have a database of academics who are engaged in entrepreneurial activities. So we had to go to technology transfer officers or similar institutions within those 13 universities and we asked them to provide a list of activities <coughs> and their contact details of those who have engaged in these six types of entrepreneurial activities that I have mentioned at the beginning, the knowledge transfer three, knowledge cooperation three activities during the last five years because we also wanted to check the change. So then we conducted <coughs> interviews uh, to understand their motivation and decision making approaches that they have used. But then it was more like a narrative analysis. We were asking them, okay, how did you start it and, and how the things have evolved, how the motivation may have changed. Um, I mean, it's more like a narrative based approach. We conducted 115 in-depth interviews, uh, which we have postponed. As a result, we were able to conduct both uh, qualitative and quantitative qualitative and quantitative analysis. So, first, straight, straight away moving into findings, what we found was that regardless of knowledge trust or co-creation, motivation changed from push to pull. So initially it was push, so as you could see these are the three knowledge trust activities that we have uh, studied. So you could see with respect to conducting training and seminar sessions for industry, they were telling that initially they did not have in, enough contacts with industry personnel, so that was one of the motivation to uh, conduct training and seminar sessions for industry. Uh, but of course, uh, they wanted to overcome uh, income issues, income barriers. But over time, with the development of resources, now they are more interested in doing it because of the personal satisfaction. And if you look at research-based consultancy, so again, they did not even have sufficient income to do their own research. Uh, what they said was, in Sri Lanka, uh, the government is in high resource limited environment. And interestingly, when you look at the government, uh, the universities, 
uh, the universities provide free education. So you don't get the fee coming from students. So since government doesn't have a lot of money, the government cannot provide sufficient funding to universities. So even to engage in their own research, they have to rely on the money vested within businesses. So initially, it was really, really pushed. Even to do my own research, I had to work with businesses. It's not like they had enough research grants coming into their university. And but over time, then you could see that they did not have, in, their financial conditions were very poor. But over time, with the development of activities, uh, then you could see, now I do it because I want to save some money, like more the desire for wealth, the other end of the continent. Um, and also, if you look at um, transferring IP, Initially, they did it by themselves because they did not have anyone to collaborate with. But now, it's more like there is a demand for them. They develop the status, they develop the recognition. Now, they do it in order to tap opportunities. Similarly, with respect to knowledge co-creation, you could see the similar dynamics there. A lack of resources uh, initially, but now they do it since they want to provide opportunities for students. So, I'm not going to go into all the things. But you could see clearly the motivation has changed from push to pull, particularly uh, with the development of resources, the recognition, the status, and everything. So this is further supported by, this is just descriptive studies of, um, because I said that we have post scored their motivations. So you could see this one here, it's about initial motives. And you could see the initial modules, this is knowledge transfer, knowledge co-creation, all are push factors. But of course you could see a slight differences between what really has motivated knowledge transfer and knowledge co-creation. However, if you look at the change, it's basically from push to pull because later subsequent motives were pulled, whether it's knowledge transfer or knowledge co-creation. Building on this, then we try to map motivation with decision-making approaches. That's where we found really interesting results. So, as I said, I said we thought that initially, yes, they are being motivated by push. They will use effectuation approach. But with respect to knowledge transfer, what we found was that even during initial heavy resource-constrained environments, there were 42% of academics who have used causation approach, which was on the contrary to our expectation. And of course, with the development of resources, everyone has moved to majority, have moved to effectuation and, co sorry, pull causation. Oh. Pull causation approach. So, we really wanted to understand now why do we have this 42% of academics at the initial stages, why do they adopt or how do they adopt causation approach? So in order to understand this difference, we use regression analysis. Interestingly, what we found was that more senior academics uh, those who have administrative experience are more likely to use causation approach even during uh, initial resource constraint status. Because the, what our in -depth interviews revealed was that yes, they are under heavy resource constraints. However, when you are senior, when you have a lot of administrative experience, you could still think of, they always think of a goal. When they select a company to transfer knowledge, they were thinking about the future value the company could generate. And also they were thinking about some goals. Okay, I want to achieve this goal by transferring knowledge to this company. So even though they did not have personal resources, because of their experience and network of contacts, they were able to pool resources. Whereas more junior academics, who did not have administrative experience, they had to simply rely on the resources in hand. So during the resource constraint stages, they were using <coughs> effectuation approach. Is that clear? Yeah, great. And then moving into knowledge co-creation, because initially it was about knowledge transfer. Now we are moving to knowledge.
knowledge for creation where they combine their knowledge forces. Even though senior academics, you could say, at the initial stages of knowledge for creation, the majority of them were using effectuation. The push is similar, they were using effectuation. Because <coughs> why the senior academics could not do that? Because for co-creation, it's not like transfer. It requires really high level of uh, resources. Because that means you combine your resources, you combine your knowledge forces, you work very closely with uh, industry. For that, they could not, even with their experience, they could not pool resources. They had to rely on uh, the type of resources in hand. But what was really interesting was that, with respect to co-creation, even though we expected that people will move to uh, pool causation, we could see 24% of academics were remaining in the effectuation. Why is that? What then, what regression results indicated was that those who were in basic sciences compared to those who were in applied sciences were remaining in the effectuation side because those who are in basic sciences uh, they are more curiosity driven and the intuitive so they were simply trying to do something with the resources in hand so that's why we were able to see some academics in that quadrant so what does it say uh, in terms of conclusions, I would highlight three conclusions. So the first, when it comes to motivation of academics in a resource constrained environment, we could see the motivation changes from push to pull. And more interestingly, uh, addressing another debate, because someone may argue that if you are in a resource constrained environment, if you do not have enough resources, then perhaps you shouldn't engage in entrepreneurial activities because it will create more demand for your resources, more conflicts. Uh, on your limited resources. But on the contrary, these academics use entrepreneurial engagements to improve their resource status. So this provides a really good uh, implication for university administration and also policymakers. In a resource constrained environment, you should encourage entrepreneurial engagement as a way of overcoming uh, resource barriers. And you have to be mindful of the changes in motivation as well from push to pull. And the second, with respect to uh, knowledge transfer activities, what we found was that uh, senior academics with more administrative experience, uh, they are in a stronger position to use causation approach. Whereas more junior academics who do not have um, industrial administrative experience, uh, they are more likely to use effectuation approach. What does it mean? Because effectuation approach means it's more risky. So uh, when it comes to rewards, it's very important to understand these differences. Uh, because you shouldn't expect the same from both the types of academics. So it, it's quite important to understand and try to be a bit flexible towards junior academics and to tolerate any, any mistakes. Because that is the stage where they are. But over time, of course, with the experience, they will develop and they might try to engage in less risky work. And uh, the, with respect to co-creation, what we found was that um, even at a later stage, uh, the academics in basic sciences are more likely to still adopt effectuation approach. So when it comes to policy making and other things, it, we have to be mindful, you know, mindful of the difference between uh, these disciplines. So uh, it, it might not make sense to request everyone to generate same types of impacts. So with this, let me move on to the second paper. So the second paper, it's about the diversification strategies adopted by entrepreneurial academics. Uh, this paper is relatively less developed, I would say. Uh, we just finished the analysis but I'll try to provide you with some uh, contextual understanding as well. So uh, when it comes to uh, past papers, so when we look at diversification, we try to see the effect of individual and perceptual factors. So when you look at past papers, uh, they do talk about the effect of micro and meso level factors on academics to engage in entrepreneurial activities as well as for academics to be successful uh, through their engagement. However, there is a significant lack of focus made 
in uh, literature about diversification strategies adopted by academics. Because if you look at the unit of analysis as the academic, they might engage in a wide array of different entrepreneurial activities. That means they may have different, they may adopt different diversification strategies. But there is a real lack of focus on understanding that particular aspect. So this is the main research gap that we would like to address. And particularly it's relevant to resource constrained environment. Because entrepreneurship literature says that in a resource constrained environment, when you do not have a lot of resources, when you do not have a lot of opportunities, diversification is the best strategy. Because you might not be able to engage in a single activity for a, for a, for a long time in a, in a very in-depth way. But when you diversify your activities, you might be able to make the most out of uh, limited opportunities that you have. And uh, so to highlight how we have conceptualized diversification, uh, we divided different entrepreneurial activities into three. First, teaching related entrepreneurial activities. Second, research related entrepreneurial activities. Third, company creation. So teaching related activities are maybe providing external church teaching or may conduct in training and seminar sessions for industry. Uh, or uh, developing some external uh, degree programs. So all these are related to the normal teaching that we do, but then we do it for industry. And research-related entrepreneurial activities could be research-based uh, industry placements, or it could be uh, consultancy for industry through the university or privately, because uh, in Sri Lanka they can do consultancy privately as well and uh, developing products or services with potential for commercialization and also collaborating with industry in joint research projects because all these are kind of an extension to the usual research activities that you conduct and uh, sometimes you work with very closely with um, uh, the business, the small business <coughs> and accelerated programs whereas the company creation which is not exactly related to the traditional academic duties that we do. You need to have specific skills. So in this the third dimension, we specially asked whether the academic was involved in the formation, because the formation is a totally different activity that is different from the usual teaching and research activities. So in terms of formation, in order to capture everything, we ask, we look at different types of formations. So maybe the formation of joint, uh, joint uh, research labs with universities, they could do it through the university or privately, or they, they would uh, form spin-off companies, they could do it through the university, or they could, the final one, they could form their own company, or they might also engage in uh, forming some uh, centers within universities whether these centers are involved in commercialization activities and also uh, the establishment of university incubators or science parks. So these are the three activities that we use to understand diversification. And you could see when it comes to their engagement, you could see maybe they will <coughs> engage in only teaching related activities, research related activities or company creation or perhaps two of these activities or all three activities. So you could see the diversification is higher when you go from type 1 to type 7. And uh, with respect to other side, so here we talk about the diversification, the other side was uh, individual and uh, meso level factors. So when it comes to individual factors, when we look at entrepreneurship literature, that has discussed the individual factors that influence academic entrepreneurship, not diversification, we could see the age, position, level of education, gender, business management and entrepreneurial knowledge and skills, academic discipline as well as social network. Interestingly, with respect to meso-level factors, the literature does talk about the meso-level factors as objective criteria for example, the commercial orientation of the university and the department, research orientation of the university and the department, as well as resources. But when you look at entrepreneurship literature, what they argue is that 
identification of the opportunity is down to the perception of the entrepreneur of their environment. So here, what is the perception of academic entrepreneur about the commercial orientation, research strength, uh, the resources of his or her environment, which is the university uh, or the department. So because of, since we were focusing on diversification, and since we were focusing on entrepreneurial engagement, we look at the perception of academic, of the environment rather than using objective criteria. It also helped us because, as I said, in more, more practically, <coughs> in Sri Lanka we have only 13 universities. So if we use university level objective criteria, we do not have enough heterogeneity to run a regression. So that is more pragmatic way. But when it comes to theoretical argument, it's because the perception matters uh, for entrepreneurial engagement, particularly to spot opportunities. And then what we did was, we are still in the process of doing this bit to link that with the diversification literature because we need to now look at these uh, individual and perceptual factors. We have to link academic entrepreneurship and diversification literature to, to, to provide a good theoretical position. So for example, when we look at uh, the individual level factors that influence firm diversification, uh, it has been argued that demographic factors as well as uh, the position of top managers influence the firm diversification. However, here, here we are not talking about the diversification of universities. We are talking about the diversification at the level of individual. So this is where we need to do a bit of work, but roughly, if I say, uh, we kind of divided the factors into four. The first is more about the demographic factors. Second, business management and entrepreneurial skills. Third, social network. Fourth, perceptual factors. So we hypothesize that all these four factors would influence uh, academic entrepreneurial diversification. And then we divided diversification also into two. First, related diversification. Second, unrelated diversification. Because related diversification would in include something related to what they do, teaching and research related activities. So, but unrelated diversification means adding the company creation to their portfolio of engagements. So, with respect to related diversification, what we hypothesized was that perhaps it is the academic discipline which might enable them to go from teaching and research to teaching and research related entrepreneurial activities. And also, perhaps their strength of the social network would matter a lot because if they want to engage with the industry, uh, they need to have good network of contacts. And also their perceptual factors would have an influence. With respect to unrelated diversification, particularly adding company creation into their portfolio, all these factors would matter because having entrepreneurial skills, that is very important, uh, and also their demographic characteristics would play a role. So that is what we have hypothesized in the third one. So uh, for this one, we use the survey conducted. So uh, again, we don't have a database, but then by looking at the uh, websites of all 13 universities, we develop a database of academic uh, academics. So uh, from those academics, uh, we sent uh, 1,321 emails to those academics uh, and also when we sent the, we sent a questionnaire so we, when we sent the questionnaire uh, we uh, provided a personalized link to each and every academic that means as a result we could combine uh, whatever the information available in the website like gender, uh, the position, the discipline with their responses so, but of course we analyzed everything anonymously. We did not uh, look into the personal details other than that. So, uh, and then we, uh, from the emails that we have gathered, uh, 139 emails were returned. Uh, so our sample was 1,182, of which we got 378 responses. 
But then uh, the 23 questionnaires were uh, not completed, like uncompleted ones, that always happens. Um, and then finally we got 358 uh, responses that we could use, which is roughly 30% of the uh, sample. Re re response rate was 30%. And uh, we conducted non-response bias test, so there was no bias with respect to uh, the uh, university, gender, academic discipline and position. So it was good. So what is quite interesting was that, the, the, of the seven types that I have highlighted, initially 30 academics have not engaged in any of those activities. And uh, other academics, when you look at it, you could see there were 30 academics who had only engaged in teaching related entrepreneurial activities, 150 academics, those who have engaged in both teaching and research related entrepreneurial activities, 122 academics, those who have engaged in all three. So this is also a good support to what we said in the first paper. Because they try to, even to carry out teaching, even to carry out research, they have to engage in entrepreneurial activities. So that is why you could see very high level of engagement here. And also, interestingly, this gave us a really good uh, sample to study the diversification. Because the first type, it's single role academic entrepreneurs. The second type, double role academic entrepreneurs. So when we check, what made them move from single role to double role? We could see factors in fluence and related diversification. And the third type, triple role academic entrepreneurs. So when we check from sec the, the factors affecting someone to move from second to third, we could uh, have a measure of unrelated diversification. So then, uh, because these are the regression results, but I don't think that we could read that. But let me, because I, I prepared a size that is uh, more readable. Uh, so what we found was that, uh, what are the factors influencing related diversification, that means academics to move from just engaging in teaching related academic entrepreneurial activities to add research related academic entrepreneurial activities as well, because we saw these two types there, single role and double role. So uh, those who were in computing and information technologies compared to those who are in basic sciences and those who had a stronger network of contacts and also those who perceive uh, their department and universities are having greater commercial orientation. So they, they, uh, the, the type of academics who <coughs> have these qualities, they were more likely to be double role academic entrepreneurs than being single role academic entrepreneurs. Whereas the unrelated diversification, that means those who are more likely to be triple role academic entrepreneurs than being double role academic entrepreneurs, are the ones, those who are in computing and information technology, as well as agriculture compared to basic sciences, particularly agriculture might be because the, the particular contextual side of Sri Lanka, uh, which has been quite popular for agriculture and also those who are senior lecturers compared to lecturers but we did not see a difference between professors and lecturers so it looks like that the senior lecturers <coughs> are the ones who are more likely to engage in company creation in addition to teaching and research related activities so this might be down to the, the changes because professors might be coming from very old schools of thoughts uh, which we do not know yet, but uh, the senior lecturers are the ones who are more likely to engage in company creation. So, and also those who have business management and entrepreneurial skills, uh, and also those who have very strong network of contacts. So, um, I think uh, that's where we have reached with respect to the second paper, because I was specially requested to uh, talk about my working papers. So these are two working papers in academic uh, entrepreneurship, particularly in a resource constrained environment, as you have requested. And uh, so if you have any specific suggestions on uh, any uh, specific literature <coughs> that we should focus on, or um, any journals that we should target, or, and, and also any other comments are highly welcome. So, um, I don't know what you know whether we have got maybe uh, three minutes or so oh, just, yeah, to, sure, sure. just to highlight the, the, the kind of my research very briefly. 
So um, I would say uh, this is the main um, contribution that I make. So I try to contribute to uh, entrepreneurial co-creation. So here, entrepreneurial co-creation means how different types of entrepreneurs work together very closely by combining their knowledge forces to generate academics as well as social values. So uh, you could see this paper here, uh, which is in press, uh, where uh, we established this concept, but of course we went further beyond that. So uh, in this paper, we try <coughs> to see how uh, these different entrepreneurs use open innovation to generate both social and economic wealth. So then my other papers look at co-creation from different dimensions. So this paper here looks at co-creation uh, in the dimension of startup entrepreneurs. So you could see the dimension here. But of course we look at, when it comes to startup entrepreneurs, we look at their engagement with other different types of entrepreneurs. So in this particular paper, we try to see uh, how the micro-level practices adopted by owner managers influence their ability to engage in sustainability activities collectively with other types of actors in the innovation ecosystem. And this paper here looks at it from the perspective of academic entrepreneurship. And particularly, we try to understand how uh, entrepreneurial engagement by academics act as a rivalry or synergy with their traditional academic duties. So whether that's a rivalry or synergy between academic entrepreneurship and traditional academic duties, particularly in a resource constrained environment. And these two papers here look at co-creation from the angle of corporate entrepreneurship, but we look at firms that interact with universities. The first paper, we try to see how relational capabilities adopted by firms who interact with universities enable them to co-create and transfer knowledge when they are interacting with universities. And the second paper, uh, we look at uh, SMEs and how they could generate value beyond achieving immediate project outcomes when they are interacting with universities. That means how they could explore other opportunities. And the, these two papers here look at it from the perspective of intermediaries. So when intermediaries are interacting with other actors, first one, uh, what, what is the effect of knowledge-based practices adopted by them? when they want to generate value for themselves when they are working with other actors in an innovation ecosystem. And the second paper we look at uh, what are the characteristics of hybrid competency centers as triple helix organizations. <coughs> so, and also the other upcoming papers which are in r and or under review, uh, we look at the society aspect as well as the government aspect as well. So I think uh, with this I would like to conclude my presentation and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.